Now, welcome to another edition of News from Naboo, with Thor's lightning takes, as always. Mm. <laughs> Let us get right to the news. We'll start out with a spoiler warning. Both articles we're going to be going over today have spoilers for Kenobi up to the fourth episode. So if you haven't seen them, click away now. <laughs> I said it like you do. <laughs> no, I say it better. Whatever. All right, so we'll top it off. Hayden Christensen on channeling the inner turmoil of Darth Vader in Obi-Wan Kenobi. So Hayden talked with The Hollywood Reporter. He shared some insight into Vader's mind during the events of the show. He explained the context behind our first glimpse of Darth Vader in Obi-Wan Kenobi at the very end of part two where Obi-Wan's kind of meditating and you see Vader open his eye. That, that yeah. part? Okay. He said that in the moment, Obi-Wan's trying to like connect with him. 10 years after their last encounter. Hayden said, there's just so much history to that relationship. There's obviously a great bond that was broken, and I think Vader is still very much affected by that. That first shot in the back to tank when you see Vader opening his eyes, the idea is that Obi-Wan is connecting with him and coming to his attention again. I was kind of wondering about that, if it was meant to be implied, because, you know, mm -hmm. is it just supposed to be coincidental or dramatic that, you know, we're seeing kind of Vader reassembled just as Kenobi's learning he's still alive. And... We've seen before in Clone Wars and stuff, we, we know Master Padawan, always going to be a bond there. We see, you know, Dooku connecting with Yoda. There's a little bit of Sith sorcery involved from Palpatine and all that. But, you know, the bond is always strong. There's always a, a connection in the Force. So it kind of makes sense that maybe, you know, the first time maybe he's really considered the possibility that Anakin is alive in a very long time might somehow trigger Vader. I, I'm, I'm okay with something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and it almost seemed like they connected again when we saw Obi-Wan in the back to tank yeah. flashing to Anakin that maybe Vader was reaching back. I like that. I mean, I thought that was another perfect opportunity to do some sort of flashback, some sort mm -hmm. of, you know, again, give us some context within the show itself of why this is such a, a big deal. I know, I know most Star Wars fans already know that, but there are fans who are newer to the series or don't, you know, know the lore as well, so... Give us a little hint of why it's such a big deal that these two are kind of, you know, connecting with each mm -hmm. other. And, you know, he's kind of awakening Vader and all that. Like, show us that. You know, the episode was only like 30 minutes long anyway. Give us two or three minutes of a flashback. Why not? It actually took a team of five people to bring Darth Vader to life in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Three of them, two aside from Hayden himself, were actually tasked with wearing the suit. Uh, Christian explained that they needed someone that resembled the character's in-universe height for wide shots, which... Put He's a little stilts. short for a Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah. Get some stilts, he'll be fine. He says, I'm not the only one in the suit because of the height difference between myself and the character. There's some stuff that's just a bit too challenging for us to try to film with me in the suit. So I do what I can, and then I have the help of a couple of other great performers who do a lot of the work as well. It's kind of cool that they're sharing the mantle. Well, yeah, the I mean, I, I kind of figured that Hayden's probably only in there for certain moments and scenes. Probably when it's just, you know, him out of the suit, of course. That's Hayden and prosthetics uh -huh. and all that fun stuff. So, not surprising. It, you try not to think about the fact that it's not, you know, always the Hayden Christensen in there. I mean, though at the same time, you do want to give credit to the, you know, the stunt performers, too. You don't want to take anything away from them. What I always find interesting is we always overlook how long it takes to, to transform somebody into something. You know, when they were doing Hayden back to scenes, that takes like four to five hours of makeup, sitting in a chair, being as, you know, still as possible to let the, you know, the makeup artists do all their work. And that's... Yeah, for, for a 10 second clip of him in a tank <laughs> of water, essentially. Right, right. At least, yeah. if, at least knowing that he's going to be in the tank, they might not have to be quite as, you know, they close to it. Well, and CG helps a little bit these days, too. Yeah, they don't have to pay, you know, quite as much attention to details, what I was trying to say, as they might normally have to if he's just going to be himself on screen, but... Still, I'm sure that's a hours and hours of the hours. process. All right. He was asked if there's still any part of Anakin fighting inside Vader. Yes. Mm. I always see Anakin as a through line, an undercurrent to this character. Vader is trying his best to kill off that side of him, but there always has to be a little bit of Anakin in there. And that presents itself. And that's a part of the fun. I'm always thinking about the Anakin aspect of this character. I don't know about that. I think I, I don't think... Anakin is dead and gone, obviously, because he returns. But I've always said, and it's, you know, my headcanon, you can disagree, as I always say, which irritates people. But my headcanon is the minute that Anakin starts to gain a foothold again is in The Empire Strikes Back. Well, I'm not saying he gains a foothold or anything, just that he, there's a tiny spark yeah. of Anakin still alive. Yeah, but he's kind of, he almost makes it sound like he implies that, like, Anakin is still, like, somehow, like, 
in there and still dictating something. And I don't believe that to be the case. I, like I was saying, I think it's in The Empire Strikes Back when, when his son, who he offers the galaxy to, who he offers everything that is important to him, you know, and, you know join me, father and son, we're going to rule the galaxy together. And Luke's like, I'd rather die. To me, that's always been the moment that Vader's like, the door opens and Anakin gets to come back in because Vader sees that his own son, you know, whether or not he really thinks of him as a son in that moment, you know, because he is Darth Vader, his own son would rather die than have all these things that he's worked so hard to achieve as a, you know, as a Sith, as a Darksider. Well, let's continue on with more talk about Anakin here. Christensen also addressed the fight at the end of part three, how they tried to blend David Prowse mannerisms as Vader and with part of Anakin still living inside the character. He said... You know, this is the first time we've seen Vader sort of chronologically this close to Anakin Skywalker character. So there's some indications of Anakin and his old fighting styles in there. But for the most part, we're trying to remain true to what we know and love about this character and make sure we honor the way he moves and sounds to stay true to that continuity. Yeah, I don't know how much Anakin's fighting style would be able to translate once he's in the suit. Right. I mean, I'm sure there's still, you know, remnants of it, don't get me wrong. Right, because... But he, I mean, Vader, he pretty much had to learn almost a new fighting style, accommodating his new suit, yeah. his new body parts. Yeah, he's, he's, he's much bulkier now than he was as Anakin running yes. and jumping and doing whatever he wanted to do. He's now kind of a... Not, not so mobile anymore, we'll put it that way. So, is there... Is it, I mean, does he take anything away from Anakin's fighting style? Sure, but well, I think it's mainly... He might still be in the process of adapting his style to the one we know solidly. Yeah. He then added that in his mind, it was very shocking to Vader that Obi-Wan was completely disconnected from the Force, though he couldn't elaborate much in an attempt not to spoil the final two episodes. Well, I think that came as a shock to Vader to see how disconnected from the Force Obi-Wan is at this point. I think Vader wants Obi-Wan to be able to put up a f- more of a fight. I don't want to say too much about what's to come. I mean, can he sense that he was disconnected? Like Maybe. Well, he fought him and he was like, that's weak. Yeah, I, okay, during the fight, I thought you were implying no. like that's what no, woke him no. up as he felt the reconnection to the Force. No. Well, no, I, I, that's what I've said. I mean, look, we can... I know people have an issue with him letting Obi-Wan go and all of that. And I'm not saying I don't have any issue with that either. But I think, I think there is just a level of disappointment, right? He's been right. waiting 10 years to face Obi-Wan Kenobi, his former master who defeated him. And now he's like a, a pale shadow of that, that man he once was. So mm-hmm. there is probably that part of him that's like, this isn't what I... I've been there's, waiting for. There's no satisfaction in beating someone who's just gone weak. Yeah, I mean, sure, he wants him to suffer. He eventually wants to kill him. I'm not saying that has changed at all. But I think there is a part of him that wants to be able to beat the guy who beat him once upon a mm-hmm. time. At, at his height, not just, you know, defeat the shell of a man he used to be. Right, it's like uh, any type of sports player, really. I mean, think about when you go to the Olympics and they have a rivalry with a, a certain different country. You want to beat them while they're at their, their top of their game. So you can yeah. really feel... Like I were, did my best. I beat them. Not oh, well, they had a huge injury coming into this, and they're not going to be as strong as they should be. Yeah, you Beating don't want an asterisk isn't, next to your isn't victory. The same. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to beat the team at half strength. You want to beat you know you want to be able to beat them at full strength and be able to say I am the champion. We beat them at their best, and we were at our best, and we were right. victorious. Right, now, not, does that explain <laughs> him letting Obi Wan go and all the hatred that should be there for him? Yeah, that's debatable. But anyway, go ahead. All right, then we'll talk about something a little fun that Hayden Yay, had in his interview. Fun stuff. I feel like we've been so serious in videos lately since the Kenobi. St- and I, you know, <laughs> like one of the parts of the points of the channel was to, you know, be a little more lighthearted and fun. And it's just ever so, since Kenobi, I feel like it's all uh, we have to debate the Kenobi series, which I enjoy. Don't get me wrong, but let's have some fun. Christensen was then asked if he had a particular moment from the prequels he was especially proud of. He replied by sharing the following amusing anecdote from George Lucas on the set of Attack of the Clones. I don't know that I have a scene that I was most proud of, but there's a scene where Anakin goes back to Tatooine in episode two, and he speaks to Watto. The script had the dialogue written in English, and then in parentheses it said, in Watanese. It wasn't until the day before we started filming that I went to George and I was like, what should Watanese sound like? And he was like, well, you know, so long as it doesn't sound like English or any other language that might sound familiar, you could just make it up. <laughs> Yeah, he does say laughs in parentheses. So. Yeah, that's... So I was rushing the night before to try and figure out how to make up Watney's. And every time I see that scene, I get a bit of a kick out of it. Nice. <laughs> so he just made up some sounding the things. Random. And was like, yep. He does pretty good. I never even really thought about the fact that he might, you know, I thought he's, that... He's not, he's not Tolkien. He didn't write the oh, whole language. Geez, no, Tolkien, yeah. <laughs> 
the funny thing. Like Lord of the Rings is almost based on the languages more than anything else. Like he started with the languages and went from mm-hmm. there instead of like making it up the night before. But no, that's a that's a fun story. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm never going to watch that scene the same again now. No, because I'm it's, always going to think about the fact that he's cool. just making it up, which he's is cool. Making it yeah. up. Let's move on to our second story of the day. And it's more from Joby Harold. Oh yes, more Kenobi Joby Harold. He's going constantly to explain. explaining like the series to, like, to us. Um, it's just, he's got his own channel now. Joby Harold explains. I know it should be like <laughs> you know you know there's 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 issues with your series when I feel like every day I'm getting a new article like he's explaining this he's explaining this so it's like Shouldn't the point his of the show, show have explained it. Thank you. Yes. The, if your story needs explaining, your story has failed on some level. And I'm not a. I'm not saying the show is terrible, but explaining the finer details. But to have to explain major plot revelations is a problem. Yes, when, when every when everything is a question in the series, like there's probably a problem here. All right. So he's going to explain why Fortress Inquisitoris is significant to Obi Wan's journey. This time he interviewed with Sci-Fi, and he, they uh, had questions about, of course, the fortress and what it represents to Obi Wan and why. And what he it had, represents yeah. to Obi Wan, it's yeah. an Inquisitor fortress. So, of course, fans of Jedi Fallen Order were in for a treat as the episode took us to a actual like level in the game. Yes, in the game, the final level in the game. Yeah. yeah, Harold noted having the game as a visual reference like helped the designers in integrating elements of the existing story into one another. And placing Obi Wan in the middle of a monument to the fall of the Jedi was something that needed to happen to test the character. It was an exciting opportunity to look to that and help weave everything together within bigger canon. It's a very cool facility, and it's kind of a world that we haven't seen before. You don't know, we saw it in the first <laughs> You just said we've seen it before. It's intimidating and imposing in its own way, and it's partly sort of just thinking. What's the worst place you could ask Obi-Wan to go? There's few places that would be more horrific to have him contend with. I can think of a couple. <laughs> about the Imperial Palace, aka the former Jedi Temple on Coruscant, or how about Vader's Palace or Castle on Mustafar? No, oh, but they made this place more horrific for him. So yeah, they had to throw the dead Jedi in the basement to make it dramatic. And and look, that does line up with Rebels. Don't get me wrong; we know that they use them basically to try to lure in the Jedi. So yeah, that, that's fine. That's Luminara fine. Luminara that's yeah. They Rebels. use Luminara and Rebels to lure in Kanan, and, and that's that's fine. I have no issue with that. But to make it sound like that is like. The reminder for Kenobi about the you know the fall of the Jedi. I'm sure it's something he thinks about daily, and there probably would have been other ways to show that besides having to take us to the you know the Inquisitor's fortress. Harold explains that Obi Wan Kenobi needed to learn the truth about what was being done to the Jedi, or I guess in this case with the Jedi. Yeah, they're not done to them. <laughs> right. your, yeah, well, but their bodies to them. to them. Yeah, whatever. Obi Wan's been in a cave and he knows what's been happening, but he hasn't been confronted with it in the reality of how it's evolved. Leia calls him to action, but through the course of his journey, he has to confront what has happened to the galaxy and also what's happened to the Jedi. It stops being theoretical and philosophical and starts being right in his face to the point where it's a couple of feet away and he's faced with this harsh horror. Didn't you get faced with harsh horror in episode one where Nari the Jedi was hung? You would think so. But that, that was wasn't pretty... enough. Weird. Well, I would think seeing the the recordings, you know, digging into the archives, you know... Might have been pretty harsh, too, back in mm-hmm. episode three. Having to fight his brother might have been pretty harsh reality of how things had changed in the same movie. I don't know. Then he makes a horrifying discovery about what has become of many of his fallen allies in the decades since the fall of the Republic. Their corpses have been collected by the Inquisitors and preserved in some sort of amber, either, you know, for the sake of dark research and dark sciences, <laughs> or, or, to make dinosaurs poss- later. <laughs> or possibly as murder trophies. Harold explained that Obi-Wan reflecting on what has become of his allies is meant to further his resolve to want to stop the Empire. He says, uh, These are the moments where you step outside the narrative of the show and you have Obi-Wan gets to reflect upon the bigger universe in the timeline because it's such a specific time. We need to find something that could exist in the bowels of the fortress that could be dynamic enough that it would really impact him in that way was tricky, but also important. And then finding this sort of butterfly display of these Jedi kept in perpetuity and forever enshrined in this horrific way, it felt like a really important moment within the bigger journey. Is this going to make his resolve to fight the Emperor too high? 
I mean, yeah. well, what's going to keep him on Tatooine now that he's like <laughs> yeah, he's seeing like, nah. all of his brethren enshrined? And turns out Obi Wan got back just in time for a New Hope. He had been off world for the last ten years, and he got back. <laughs> oh, jeez, look at the time. It's almost uh, we're almost catching the original trilogy. I better get back so I can line up to that. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was a cool scene. I'm not. It was a cool scene. It, it was. was interesting because again, it, it does fit with the rest of the canon. You, you see that you know they are exactly. using the Jedi and it's it's sadistic and you know is there dark science and other things going dark on down science. there? It, it's fine. I thought it was a cool moment. I don't know that I thought it was like a profound moment for Obi Wan. It's was, a reminder, sure. It was a small part of me to be when I first saw the scene. I wondered if they were still alive, such as like when Han was preserved in carbonite, but mm. they didn't seem to have machinery keeping them going. No, I think they were quite, they would, yeah, quite they clearly just, dead, yeah, dead, dead. Just frozen in uh, amber and, or something yeah, along those lines. Yeah, just being held on to for purposes. To lure in Jedi. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was cool. I mean, like, no those, I feel like those were tools, not trophies, because they kept the trophies in their main office where they had all of the lightsabers, lightsabers. and stuff up there. So I think those were the trophies... Down there, those are being saved for purpose. Yeah. We know we know Palpatine liked his dark science. <laughs> That's how he came back from the dead, right? I mean... He, Secrets only the Sith knew. For all we know, those were part of the fuel, and maybe using them was why he was trying to, you know, do his cloning stuff or whatever he was doing with Snoke, and he had plenty of sure. specimens to uh, practice on, I sure. suppose. Yeah. Yeah, he, he needed a living one. They needed Grogu. Even though they had all of them locked up in the basement there. <laughs> Maybe those guys started to degrade over time. Maybe. I have yeah. no idea. I have, Let's try not to think about it too much. It's probably for the best. All right. Well, I guess that's all we got for you this time. So take to the comments below. Tell us what you think of today's news. Or tell us what you think of what we think of today's news. And let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.